Welcome to South Asia Chat, a podcast brought to you by the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. I am your host, Ramita Ayer, a research analyst at the Institute. On 31st March 2023, Indian Minister of Commerce Piyush Goyal announced the country's latest foreign trade policy, the FTP 2023. This policy replaces the previous FTP 2015 to 2020, which had to be extended several times due to the pandemic and other geopolitical developments. In this episode, I will be discussing this year's policy and its implications with Ms. R. V. Anuradha, partner Claris Law Associates, New Delhi. Anuradha, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So to start off, could you share on what a foreign trade policy is, uh, what are its aims and how does it guide India's trade-related decisions? Uh, thanks, Ramita. The foreign trade policy, uh, unlike just being uh, uh, an overall policy document or a vision document, is actually a policy that the government is mandated to enact pursuant to what is called the Foreign Trade Development and Regulation Act. So the, the, since, the, since the objective of the policy itself arises from an existing law, the policy in itself is more about implementation rather than about vision setting. The primary difference, however, in the FTP 2023, and that's what has also created a fair amount of excitement, is that unlike previous foreign trade policies, which were typically, you know, stayed uh, narration of uh, incentives that are available, what sort of forms and procedures that will have to be followed by exporters and importers, what incentives would be available. Uh, other than, you know, listing this out, the policy in itself provides a bit of policy signaling in terms of what is the government's vision on how India can enhance its exports and benefit from trade as a vehicle for economic growth. And this is where there is a significant difference in the current foreign trade policy as compared to the previous year's foreign trade policy. Moving on now to some key features of this year's FTP. I'd first like to focus on trade facilitation and digitalization, where uh, digitalizing processes, particularly for documents and invoicing, has been identified as the key enabler to better facilitate trade. Given that the current government's focus is on the digital aspect, how does this connect to India's recent heavy engagement in FTAs? Okay, again, uh, the, the point that you raised, Samita, actually ties in very well with what I mentioned as a uh, uh, the vision of the government in terms of where does it see foreign trade policy actually moving towards. So there's an entire chapter dedicated uh, to facilitating, promoting digital trade. Uh, there is also a chapter focused on creation of e-commerce export hubs. Um, and both of these together really present a vision in terms of how to enhance um, or how to facilitate uh, digital trade and enhance India's ability in this area. But these are also areas which are setting forth broad objectives and how the government enables implementation will actually remain to be seen in terms of specific uh, initiatives that will need to be put in place. Let's take the example of the point that you mentioned in terms of uh, the, the digitalization of the economy of, 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 of through trade facilitation for digital trade. So there's an entire chapter in the foreign trade policy uh, titled Promoting Cross-Border Trade in Digital Economy. And it lays down objectives such as uh, creation of e-commerce platforms, which will enable the commercial process of buying and selling of both goods and services on the internet. It talks about um, having um, a facilitating e-commerce export logistics providers, which are essentially um, uh, you know, service providers that will provide logistic support for these e-commerce platforms. And then it talks about using existing schemes. There is something called the Niryat Bandhu scheme that the uh, Director General of Foreign Trade had put in place several years back, which has been one of the primary vehicles uh, and tools for training, capacity building uh, for exporters. 
the Nidya Bandhu scheme, as it is called, uh, Nidya in Hindi essentially means uh, export. Um, a Bandhu is friend, so a, you know, a friend to the exporter scheme, so to speak, uh, essentially has now been extended for promoting e-commerce and other emerging channels of e-commerce. Uh, there is also talk about having uh, awareness related to various rules and um, uh, various procedure, procedural aspects relating to e-commerce related activities. Another interesting feature of that chapter is uh, the creation of e-commerce export hubs, which will act as a center for favorable business infrastructure and facilities. Now, if we actually look at all of this, they are signaling the government's commitment towards digitalization and trade facilitation. Uh, but as I mentioned, this objective now needs to be translated to actual action points by the Director General of Foreign Trade, by other wings of the central government, in order to actually enable the realization of the benefits that this vision statement puts forward. So other key highlights of the FTP include its focus on encouraging grassroots exports, setting up e-commerce export hubs, and increasing the acceptance of uh, Indian rupee payments. Could you share your thoughts on these aspects and how are they likely to benefit India, especially the Indian MSMEs? So, with regard to um, you know the the, the, uh, the when, I, when I mentioned in the beginning in terms of uh, vision setting um, and the uh, you know, policy statement from the government, uh, other than the issue of digitalization and e-commerce uh, exports that we just discussed, one of the other areas that it talks about is a. a a good way of putting it is a decentralized or a bottom-up approach for export development. It is the first time we are seeing it in any government policy uh, where the government talks about uh, actually enabling districts in India, uh, again for, the, uh, uh, for a non-Indian to uh, explain what, what this is all about. We have a federal structure, we have the center, then we have the states in India, the union territories, and every state is divided into districts. Or, or provinces, um, for, uh, you know, as an alternative terminology. So the government has envisaged creation of uh, districts as export hubs, and in what it calls the district export hubs initiative, and then places the owners on each district to come up with a district export plan, whereby they would identify what is a good or a service uh, amenable for export, which needs the benefits of the foreign trade policy and then makes uh, a potential accessibility for these identified goods and services to existing government schemes for facilitating export. So we have uh, something called the Market Access Initiative, and of course I've mentioned the Niryad Bandhu scheme. So between these two initiatives, uh, the idea is that every district export action plan would identify the nature of goods and services from that district for which a MAI or the Market Access Initiative or the Nidyad Bandhu Scheme benefits could be available, could be accessible. And then it places, um, uh, it consolidates it one step further by placing the onus on the state government. So the state government will then need to consolidate the you know, district export action plans and then facilitate it in terms of uh, communicating this to the central government uh, and you know the, the state export promotion committees, which would be headed by the chief secretary of each state, would be required to synergize these efforts with the central level. At the central level, we have the director general of foreign trade. So this again, the sort of a vision in terms of a bottom-up approach play, um, has tremendous potential in terms of how it can actually facilitate access. Uh, for uh, you know, niche product uh, categories for exports. Uh, the actual implementation of this, again, as I mentioned, will need to be rolled out. Um, and it will, it will be the first time for, you know, in terms of uh, how this will actually lead up to the overall export development of the country. You mentioned MSMEs. Again, this is an area where uh, there are several incentives that have been specified uh, in the, uh, in the overall uh, vision of the foreign trade policy. There is, uh, of course, you know, uh, areas such as uh, uh, benefits to MSMEs in terms of reduced fees, 
uh, which is typically something which we see across jurisdictions. Um, so, you know, um, substantially reduced fees for various uh, foreign trade schemes that are actually put in place for MSMEs, preferential terms uh, uh, in terms of trade uh, for reduced examination or faster clearances and other benefits for MSMEs um, under several programs of the foreign trade policy. There are also certain exemptions that have been granted to MSMEs. Um, there's another interesting feature in the policy uh, which links with, to both MSMEs and also to the e-commerce uh, export component. Uh, the, the government envisage, has envisaged uh, the post offices, uh, or what we call in, uh, again, uh, in India, the dark ghar. So there's something called the dark ghar Nidhyat Kendras, that is the, uh, you know, when post offices will act as centers for exports that will enable MSMEs to reach the international market. So again, another facilitation component that has been built into the foreign trade policy, which will have uh, significant benefits in easing access to uh, trade channels. So these are some of the aspects uh, which are relevant from, you know, to, to address your points in relation to you know, the grassroots level exports that, that the foreign trade policy seeks to promote. The current FTP also has some new focus areas, uh, such as promoting cross-border trade in digital economy, expanding the list of um, green technology products, and also streamlining licensing procedures. What are the likely implications of these changes? Um, as far as the digital economy part of it is concerned, we, we just discussed in terms of you know, the various facilitative schemes and e-commerce export hubs that are going to be put in place, and the uh, you know, capacity building, um, enhancing access. Those are some of the features of um, the, the components of the FTP relating to uh, uh, the, 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 cro the cross-border trade in digital economy. Uh, the other point that you mentioned is in relation to green tech. Now, green technology products have always found a place uh, within our FTP. What the new FTP does is to enhance this list. So, for example, some of the new uh, green tech products that have been included in the list of uh, green hydrogen, uh, battery-operated vehicles, uh, given the um, enhanced focus on uh, electric vehicles. Uh, there is also a component on vertical farming equipment. Uh, another new category is wastewater treatment and recycling, rainwater harvesting systems. These are some of the uh, you know, new elements that have found place within the FTP. But other than that, uh, there are several other uh, items which remain uh, from the previous FTP, which include uh, the equipment relating to solar energy, wind energy. Uh, you know, uh, this is something which has always been part of the FTP and continue, uh, uh, continue being there in terms of uh, favorable terms of trade. And yes, I think this ties in well with uh, the overall vision for economic growth in terms of, you know, what are the type of products which will need a greater focus in terms of um, um, access to the trade channels as an enabler for economic growth as a whole. From an inclusivity perspective, uh, does the new FTP provide an opportunity for greater participation of all sections of the society, including women in trade? Well, gender and women doesn't have a specific mention in the foreign trade policy. But as I mentioned, the, the focus is really more on um, decentralized development. So perhaps one could imagine uh, uh, a special incentive and greater empowerment uh, in terms of uh, capacity building, credit facilities, uh, which potentially could find a place in, say, the district export action plan or the state export action plan. But as a component of the FTP itself, uh, uh, there are no specific benefits uh, as far as uh, women are concerned. But when you say in terms of overall inclusivity, uh, from a complete gender-neutral gender perspective, uh, yes, to the extent that it has, as I mentioned, one of the, the key features is this entire bottom-up uh, kind of an approach, which is something refreshing and which is something to really look forward to in terms of how it actually plays out. And within that overall decentralized mechanism, uh, um, a, a more specific focus on uh, gender inclusivity, there is certainly space for that uh, to, to further develop.
Uh, finally, what is your assessment of the FTP in addressing not only India's economic concerns, but also its larger geoeconomic ambitions? Um, yeah, before I come to that, Amitha, I think one of the other, you know, in terms of uh, key features of the FTP, there are a couple of features that I wanted to reflect on uh, before I come to, you know, the overall uh, uh, vision in terms of uh, trade and development. One of the aspects is in relation to what we, um, you know, in, in terms of simplification, is in relation to what we call the SCOBIT list. Now, SCOMIT is um, an acronym for Special Chemicals, Organisms, Materials, Equipment, and Technology. Again, this has been part of our FTP for several years now. Um, it essentially, you know, SCOMIT essentially refers to dual use items, including software and technology. Uh, when I say dual use, it means it has the potential for both civilian and uh, industrial application, as well as uh, potential use in weapons for mass destruction. Now, a SCOMIT list um, is typically uh, pursuant to obligations under various international treaties and conventions. So, um, uh, India, along with most other countries in the world, uh, is a member of, say, the Biological Weapons Convention, the Chemical Weapons Convention, the um, MTCR, that is the Missile Technology Control Regime. Then there is the Vasanar Agreement on Export Control. Um, the SCOMIT list is essentially deriving from the various obligations that are uh, uh, that are pursuant to these. Uh, SCOMIT has been a part of FTP, but typically the, the evolution of SCOMIT in the last few years has been through separate uh, notifications. So it has kind of been a spread out kind of a regime. So uh, from, a, from a business perspective, to get it all in one place has, has always been a challenge. And one of the additionalities of the new FTP is to have a simplified single chapter, which actually consolidates everything relating to SCOMIT. So there's a dedicated chapter on SCOMIT, uh, which, which um, essentially is, I would say, a facilitative uh, uh, feature of the foreign trade policy. Another aspect, uh, uh, which also is worth pointing out, uh, is and this is something that the government has also emphasized on, um, you know, when it introduced the foreign trade policy, is a shift from the existing regime, which has been more in terms of granting subsidies and incentives, and a shift towards more of facilitation of exports themselves. Uh, you know, you may also be aware that, uh, you know, in, there, was, there was a fairly widespread dispute against several of our export subsidies and incentives at the WTO that the U.S. had initiated. And there was a WTO panel report in 2019 uh, that had held that India's export subsidies, uh, several of them which were part of the FTP, uh, the earlier FTP, were, were inconsistent with our WTO obligation. So one of the components of this was something called the Merchandise Exports from India Scheme, or the MEIA. Now that, in fact, has been replaced by a scheme which is more focused on remission of duties and taxes on exported uh, products, uh, which is again in sync with what is followed in most other jurisdictions, and it is generally thought to be WTO compatible. This was done in, 21, it's in 2021 itself, and now it is uh, being crystallized as part of the foreign trade policy. But interestingly, there are a few other uh, aspects which, which actually the, the same WTO dispute uh, had held to be incompatible uh, with our uh, WTO obligations. And this included what is called the Export Promotion Capital Guarantee Scheme, as well as schemes for setting up of export-oriented units or EOUs uh, and electronic hardware technology uh, parks, software technology parks, etc. Now, these are schemes uh, which continue. So the only thing that has been, the only component of WTO compatibility that has been addressed is the scheme relating to MEIS, whereas these other schemes relating to EPCG, then to EOUs, uh, uh, then the electronic hardware technology parts, etc., they continue to be part of the foreign trade policy. One possible reason why this has happened is because um, India has appealed the WTO panel report, so there is no immediate obligation to comply with the WTO panel ruling. Uh, 
But as uh, you would know, most listeners to this podcast would know, the, the, there, is no, there is a dysfunctional dispute settlement system at the WTO as of now because there is no functional appellate body. There's nobody to hear our appeal. So to that extent, perhaps one of the thoughts uh, in terms of retaining these uh, schemes within our policy is uh, in terms of perhaps uh, waiting for the WTO system to actually uh, be put back in place and continuation of certain policies so as not to create much of disruption in the way trade has occurred so far. But this ties in with what you mentioned in terms of you know, our overall vision towards foreign trade agree uh, sorry, free trade agreements uh, that we are already entering into, which to a large extent has similar obligations in terms of not having subsidies or intense, uh, incentives which are directly linked or contingent on exports. Um, that, those, that is the problematic aspect of some of these schemes. So going forward um, and going forward with our FT engagement, I think these are some of the aspects that continue to be reviewed, which will need to be continued to be reviewed uh, for an overall reform in the process. Having said that, I think in terms of uh, uh, the engagement on FTAs, uh, again, it's, it's a matter of fact that after a hiatus of almost uh, seven to eight years, um, India's FTA engagement has substantially increased in the last few years. Um, we've had agreements concluded with Mauritius, with UAE, with Australia. Um, the Australian one is, of course, an interim agreement, and the countries are in the process of negotiating a more full-fledged, a more com comprehensive um, free trade agreement. We are, we are engaged in intensive negotiations with UK and with EU uh, on having free trade agreements. Uh, and this is expected to materialize uh, in the next, if not in the next few months, within at least the next year or so. So, so to, the, to a large extent, uh, this provides an interesting time for India's engagement as far as international trade is concerned. Um, India is also part of uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic uh, Framework that has been initiated by the U.S., which is not a typical FTA. In fact, India has stayed out of the trade pillar. But India is, a, is an integral part of uh, what we call the supply chain pillar of the IPEF, uh, which essentially has, uh, will have tremendous implications for the manner in which uh, goods are access to so export, import, uh, supply chain uh, related uh, consistencies and certainties will necessarily be impacted by our involvement in the supply chain pillar of the IPEF. Uh, and of course, one remain, it remains to be seen how IPEF itself materializes in terms of a, a new strategic vision uh, for engagement of countries in the economic sphere. This coupled with, I think, the last point that I want to uh, focus and highlight on, I mean, one of the uh, uh, achievements, and I would say uh, uh, a, a pointer in the foreign trade policy itself, and this is on the internationalization of the rupee. Uh, the FTP, for the first time, has talked about export proceeds being realized in freely, trade, uh, uh, freely convertible currency or in Indian rupees and that FTP schemes and incentives will be applicable for trade realization in rupees. Now, again, the, the vision behind this is to make the rupee a global currency, and this move, in fact, one finds um, genesis for this uh, last year itself when the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, had made a statement that the internationalization of the rupee is inevitable. And then it brought in place, it put in place a mechanism for settlement of, uh, of international settlement in rupees. Um, and we've already commenced trade with Russia, where the settlement has been in rupees. Uh, interestingly, there was a short study by the, uh, uh, the Federation of Indian Export Organizations, uh, which had estimated that the rupee trade system could potentially generate almost $5 billion in exports to Russia in a year's time. So this again remains to be seen, but there is a fair amount of buzz and excitement in terms of um, how this particular uh, initiative under the FTP could help countries facing currency failure or have dollar shortages. Um, 
So this again something which is a new feature of the policy which, which is worth looking forward to. Thank you so much, Anuradha, for the comprehensive analysis. You were listening to South Asia Chat. To learn more about our work, visit us at isas.nus.edu.sg. You can also get updates on social media. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram.